Well, I'm here at the BBC where I've been taking part in the World Service broadcast. The BBC is right at the cutting edge of new ways of broadcasting and has been innovating in this space for the last 10 years. One of the things the BBC is best known for is its website, which is seen perhaps by more people than ever watches a BBC program. It has a global reach. Um, it's uh, English speaking, but also in many other languages as well. And it's been not just text, but also the fact that you can stream programs that has made it so distinctive. And with recent technology advances, the BBC has now been able to release a lot of its archive. And I think at some point in the future, we will be able to watch every minute that has ever been recorded on TV or for radio of every program that is in the archives of the BBC, searching through their own search engine or through Google. Already, it could be said that the majority of bandwidth use in some parts of the UK at some parts of the day is a direct result of BBC streaming from its own website, Multimedia Content, which is a staggering achievement and has all kinds of implications for bandwidth providers and for the whole infrastructure of the internet in the UK. And we're seeing the explosive growth of multimedia content worldwide, not just from the BBC, but from many, many other sites, including, of course, YouTube, which is now the largest TV station in the world. And as part of the response to the YouTube community, which is streaming maybe 500, 600 million video clips every single day, the BBC has gone interactive with, pro with uh, programs like Have Your Say on BBC World Service and with websites that have the same name. Websites which allow the users to phone in with their content, to engage with blogs, to post comments and perhaps in the future video comments as well, to influence the editorial process, to attend editorial meetings by telephone or by email, SMS or by Skype, uh, to be totally involved in the very infrastructure of the programme, uh, forming its content, contributing to, contributing to programmes when they're going out live and so on. Is it part of a new wave? Yes, it is. Will editorial control slide to the consumer? Well, it already has. It happened years ago because, of course, program makers have always been sensitive to the size of their audiences. The only trouble is that for programs like BBC World Service, it's very difficult to actually measure that physically because of the, the broadcasting is in so many different countries. For example, uh, a big chunk of the BBC World Service coverage is in Nigeria and in Hausa language. But the fact is, it's very difficult to get accurate statistics week by week about how many people listen in what language group in such countries. So the future will be always determined by the audience. The audience is at the centre, of course, of all broadcasting. And audiences will be much more engaged than they ever have been. One of the things we can expect in the longer term would be, to, uh, for instance, on a, a TV programme with a, a comedy act uh, happening live. It, it might be possible for the comedians to actually be able to see the audience go up or down depending on which gags they, they use or they, they give an unfortunate, uh, unfortunate joke which offends part of the community and they could actually see on a, on a live meter some of their audience just melt away. Oh, we just lost half a million listeners in the last few seconds. Will we have that ability? Yes, we will. How will it happen? Just through live monitoring of uh, the kind of channels that people are watching at home. Do we have the technology to do it already? Yes, we do. The effects could be quite profound. For example, in a political interview on a program like Newsnight, it might be possible for a prime minister to more or less be voted out of office by the online community. Of course, they wouldn't resign necessarily as a result of that, but just imagine this. Imagine that a prime minister of the day is being watched by an audience of, let's say, three or four million people for an absolutely pivotal interview. Imagine that the audience themselves are being asked to comment uh, on or give their own reactions to what the prime minister is saying. You know, do you trust the person who's speaking at the moment? And to be able to see trust scores go up or down, do you think the current uh, the person who's speaking should be allowed to continue in office or do you think they should resign? And see that going up and down. Now, of course, that kind of programming would be, would be very controversial for the BBC because the first thing you'd have to do is to run a banner underneath uh, saying, uh, with a big disclaimer saying that this... Uh, a live poll is not representative of the country as a whole. It's only a live poll of those that have got the right equipment in their homes that are watching this particular programme. But watch this space. You will find all kinds of very significant things happening as a result of the interaction between audiences and programmers. As I say, it may be things like Have Your Say, uh, which will be slightly time warped, taking place over, over the week before a programme, during it and after. But it could also be in the live context as well. But the BBC is set to continue to be one of the most innovative multimedia companies on the face of the world. And we can see them setting the pace for many years to come.
I mean, what, why on earth would my country ban this video? What do you think? Any idea at all? Any ideas why it might have been banned? I cannot show it in my country. Any ideas? Any thoughts? It is reality. Any thoughts? Too many naked people. Yes, it could have been that. I think that was something to do with it. <laughs> Actually, I think they had 50,000 people right for many different reasons. There were so many reasons they couldn't find a single reason to ban it, but they just did. But importantly, there is a fundamental truth in here, which is that life is short. And technology was supposed to give us back our lives and our time, but in fact has made it even shorter. Why? Because it gives us this sensation of being driven from minute to minute and hour to hour. And sometimes some people tell me that they don't think that technology is helping them at all in the workplace. It is simply disruptive. Disruptive in the bad way, <laughs> not a good way. Okay, so actually let's have a look at um, some of the areas of convergence. We've been listening to the convergence story. It is so powerful. On the one hand, we have a satellite phone. In tomorrow's world, it becomes a mobile, uh, personalized advertising system. Uh, on the one hand, we have a mobile, personalized advertising system. And in the day after tomorrow's world, it becomes a global bank. In fact, uh, there is more money, I believe, to be made by telco companies in processing mobile phone transactions than in everything else that you could possibly do. Um, and just to capture all the value of these cards in a little RFID tag the size of a grain of sand. And this little tag has memory, hardware, software. You can read and write to it. And it is the key to the universe in future. Because when I walk into a store and I want to make a purchase, the store sends me the transaction, bloop, and I press the P button to pay, I put my thumb over the screen, and it's done. And if a company can start to seize that kind of transaction, they will earn hundreds of billions of dollars over worldwide over the next few years. So watch out. This is a powerful area. And we could find in the future that people are actually giving away the phones to try and persuade you to have the transactions. Free data, free phones, free everything you like. Just please use us to charge 95% of everything you spend. So it's interesting. Convergence, yes. In every one of your businesses, we talk of convergence. You might be a bank. We talk of convergence of mortgages on price and quality. The whole world gets very boring when everything looks the same. And my question is, how on earth do you survive when all you have to offer is the same quality and the same price? And you say, well, we just go lower on price. And that, my friends, is a very sad way to try to run a business. And the lesson of history is that all premium businesses do something different. They don't even think about convergence. What they do is they take convergent products at low price and high quality from other people, and they do amazingly different things with them. And the future, therefore, I suggest, the future of all true innovation has to be Divergence. It's doing things it's in a spectacularly different way, a way that captures the passion and the imagination of the consumer. So the iPod, a divergent product, would it have been the same with a camera, a mobile phone, uh, uh, Excel spreadsheets and email and all the rest? I doubt it. Its simplicity was something very special. And because the price of all these devices is falling, the number of devices which we will all own is going to increase dramatically. Many of them will do many things. But most of us will use most devices for one main thing. And adding new features, therefore, is only a small part of an exciting picture. Now, I mean, who wants a web fridge? I mean, who has got a web fridge? It's staggering silence. You know, I've had a web fridge for the last five years. It doesn't work. I mean, what a crazy idea. You, click, you see, the idea is, actually, I've had it since 1997. You see, what happens is you use up a product, and then you just click, 
and throw it away. And as you throw it away, tomorrow morning, by amazing piece of internet magic, another one appears through the letterbox. And the answer is that it's useless because who wants to always fill the fridge with exactly the same stuff? And if I really want to surf the internet, do I really want to do it standing in front of the fridge? No, of course not. Now, phones are getting smaller, yes, on the one hand, but on the other hand, they're getting bigger. Put your hands up if you have decided that your next personal organizer will have to be a little bit bigger because your fingers can't type or you can't read the screen. Put your hands up. You know, it's, so we are not sure what we want, but it's all to do with how we connect with the technologies we have. Here's another example. Uh, put your hands up if you have more than one of these devices in your living room. Let's have a look. Oh, my goodness. And I have a wonderful convergent answer for you, which is this. This costs four euros and 22 cents. Put your hands up if you have bought one. My word. So what happened to the convergence story? The answer is that emotion took over. We have an emotional attachment to these individual remotes, and actually, in a way, they are more practical. So while I believe in convergence, we must understand, too, where consumers are really going, which is a big reality check for us before we get too carried away about what the future will actually be. Now, let me come back to my mother or someone about the same age and ask another question, which is really, uh, does it work? And it's fundamental. Um, here I was yesterday. In fact, uh, this was this morning in London. And this is me filming myself trying to make my PDA synchronize with my computer. Put your hands up if you've had a problem doing that in the last year. Have a look. Now, my friends, we are supposed to be reasonably intelligent people here today. Some of us even are specialist IT gurus, but we are still defeated by basic tasks like trying to get our stupid address book to talk to the computer. And what it shows us is while we can race ahead with all the bits and the bytes and all the big features in the world, that actually what my mother really wants is something that plugs in and really works. And you know, and I know, that that is one of the biggest debates that's going on in the hall next door. It's not, what will your machines do for me? It's, how easy is it to use? Does it really work? And does it work every time? And what on earth happens to my business if I build my whole business on your system and then it lets me down for two days? So we are going to have to look at this whole area. I think it is a scandal. I have been involved in IT now as a consultant for since 1978. OK? And that was before IBM. The systems were more reliable in some ways then than they are now. So we have a long, long way to go uh, in order to connect with the emotions of people. OK, consumers. What about communities? Well, we talk about Web 2, and I just want to really make one point here. Yeah, we all know about it, and eBay is just one example. Uh, it's a big one. This community of people is um, a place where a third, one in three of all UK online people go to visit their community, once a month at least. 10% of all online searching time in my entire country is just people trading with each other or looking and shopping uh, with um, maybe one or two or a million others who are selling stuff. And this is the first day, and you know that there are hundreds of others of these things uh, springing up. And then there's YouTube. Uh, who's watched a YouTube video in the last six months? Well, you have joined the biggest TV station in the entire world, and it was started by a 25-year-old guy called Chad Hurley and a friend. And uh, it was my privilege to interview him recently. And uh, I said, you know, what does it feel like? You know, you had um, how much money in the bank? He said, well, basically zero. You had how many computers? He said, basically three. I said, uh, how much advertising did you spend? Basically nothing. And you're telling me that in two years, you developed the largest TV station in the entire world, just like that. And what about the software? Was it very complicated? Basically, no. You mean that anybody else could have done it in four weeks? Oh, yes. 
So it was just because you were the first. No. Well, what was it then? It captured the imagination of people. And as a result of capturing the emotions of people, Chad Hurley received a check for $1.63 billion after 24 months from Google. Interesting. What does it mean for your business? Well, I'll tell you what it means. You see, in future, if they want to find out about your business, people may go to YouTube first. Why? Because they might find a disgruntled and angry customer who spent three hours last night making 50 different YouTube video clips about your products. They might find another customer who is saying what a fantastic job you've done and how you totally revolutionized their entire business. But this is an awesome a community full of power and it's just starting. And uh, the, the, where we see it already is in the text-based communities, and in particular, one website called Travel Advisor. If you type the name of the Sheraton Hotel in uh, Belgium into the Google, you will find one of the first sites that comes up, maybe even above Sheraton's official website, is Travel Advisor which is simply a collection of hundreds of thousands of individuals like you and me who put up little comments saying, room 303 is very good, 304 is a little bit close to the lift. Or they say, this is a fantastic hotel, much better than the brochure said. Or they say, this place is so awful that my wife nearly died, please promise me you will never ever stay. Now. If you see that coming up, these entries coming up as the first and second line on Google, and on the right-hand side you see the nice, big, fat, paid-for advertisements from the Sheraton, say, which would you click on first to find out what the hotel is actually like? Put your hands up if you would, uh, you would consider clicking on TripAdvisor first to get the unofficial, real view of what the hotel is like. Put your hands up. Put your hands up if you would not trust TripAdvisor, but actually you think it's loaded with comments from the hotel themselves, and that actually the best thing is to press on the official site. My friends, my friends, you have just told me something of huge importance, which will impact every one of your businesses over the next 25 years. What you have told me is that in the online world, advertising is dead. Why? What you've told me is this. If the Sheraton has a problem with quality in London, if they really do, they'd better sort it out. Because if they can't sort out the quality, and every time someone types in Sheraton in London, they get line after line after line after line of comments, and you can see October 20th, October 21st, and you think, that was yesterday. That was yesterday. And you see hundreds of these things. I promise you, Sheraton in London can spend $1 billion in online advertising, and what will it do? It'll simply make them seem worse. Because the more they advertise saying they're the best in London, the more the gap appears between the reality. So what we learn is this, and this is very exciting if you're a smaller company. If your product is great, if your customers are satisfied, if you're connecting with their emotion, if they feel a part of your family, if they passionately believe in the service they got from you, then your fame will spread online faster than you would dare believe. And without any advertising budget in the world, you too might start a tiny business like Chad Hurley and land up with a big check after just a short time. But if there's a gap between what you promise and what you deliver, then may God himself help you because you will not survive. You will be toast and you'll be out of business faster than you would ever imagine. So actually, I'm a great passionate believer in these communities, but it means that we need to rethink advertising. Advertising, forget it. What we're talking about is information. We're talking about we're providing the online community with accurate information, which is verified by our users as correct, and you take your own choice. We're not here to sell, we're here to reveal to reveal the truth about our amazing products, which we don't think you know about. And when you come to us, we hope that you'll feel like telling some others too and pass the word along, because it helps everyone. 
So consumers, they're fickle, they can change fast, and emotion is everything. Communities, wow, they get powerful when they are together, and it's changing our whole business models in a very disruptive way, but very positive. And then the third area, companies. There are lots of technologies next door about virtual companies, virtual working, virtual teams, virtual collaboration, and rightly so. And we're talking about convergence of all kinds of platforms onto the PC, onto the phone, to enable you to get, I think, maybe 40, 50% increase in productivity. Actually, most, of, most people in most desks, I believe, could easily get, um, let me say, easily get a 20% increase in productivity just with one piece of software, which is free. Um, and uh, let me just ask you an example. Uh, who here uses Google Desktop? Right. Who here is forbidden to use Google Desktop as part of your corporate policy? You're not allowed to use it at your workplace. Put your hands up. What's really interesting, Google Desktop is just one piece of free software. All it does is it means that I can search 3 billion documents on my PC as fast as I can search 8, bi 8 billion documents online. Isn't it sad that I can search the whole of the internet in one nanosecond, but trying to find an email in my hard disk is a nightmare? So Google has just done for what they should have done anyway and put it on, 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 the, on, the, on the desktop. Now, many companies, I would say at least 70% of all multinationals will not allow any executive to install something like that on their own systems for fear of disruption uh, and chaos. So what happens is people do their emails at home and they can work productively. They can use Skype. They use um, all kinds of free online information sharing systems. They use all kinds of uh, free desk sharing and video systems and Skype and all these other things. And then they go to work, a nightmare. So uh, we are seeing a gap between the innovation which is happening in people's personal lives and what is happening in many of your businesses. And there's a big struggle to catch up with it. Because, of course, the risk of putting the new operating systems in on every PC can be very great, but we have to do it. You see, most people, I would imagine, in who work for you have more bandwidth at home than they do at work. Put your hands up if you think that's true. That the people who work for you, at senior executives, have more bandwidth at home than they have on their desk working for you. Put your hands up if that's true. Okay, so we, we are, they have power, they have access, and you know, the people who are working for you, they don't care whether it's voice over IP or whether it's ISDN. They couldn't care less. All they want to know is that it works and that it's easy to use. And we have fantastic tools. We've had them for a long time, and I think they're very badly used. Uh, one of them is shown here. This is an old video because I wanted to show you what we've had for a long time. This was a, a conference, video conference made in my house. I have wall-to-wall -wall video conferencing technology, uh, just a big data screen over my shoulder. And uh, here I am, um, I'm interacting with hundreds of people in uh, nine different countries simultaneously to wrestle with a problem. That was during the SARS outbreak. We couldn't travel. So the UN conference on the economic impact of SARS had to be done virtually, like this. You know, this kind of thing can run 365 days a year at home but if 50 of your employees were to start doing it at work, it would probably overload your office bandwidth, correct? So I'm saying we have to think completely differently. Um, and uh, you know, my wife and I went to uh, um, Japan, and uh, there was free broadband in the office, in, in the hotel room, and uh, we paid $8 for 48 hours. And so I ran a video call for 48 hours. I think we stopped it when we went to bed. I hope we did. <laughs> but uh, we ran a video call for 48 hours. Why not? Why not? We just had a link between our home and where we were. And uh, so I, was, instead, I, I usually look at my virtual desk. I usually look at the screen. You can see that blue screen there. And I'd see you in life size. Life's too short to be, have, a, have a, someone looking at me from Australia who's the size of my fingernail. Uh, I, the person's the right size, and I'm looking out to someone else's desk. And now I'm in Tokyo, I'm looking at my own desk instead. And then you know, the kids come in, say hello, sit down at my desk, and we're together. We're together in the same space. We can join up teams from Tokyo, New York, Hong Kong, uh, Brussels, at zero cost. It costs nothing to do this. 
All you have to do is turn the video projector on and load up some free software. You'll get better quality from the systems over there, but basically the tools are here and they're free and they've been here for half a decade. Um, but yet the, the, the issue is emotion. Um, and if you ask people who've done video conferences in the last six months, most people will say they didn't like it and they're not looking forward to doing it again. Actually, shall I show you one of the answers to video conferencing? The key to video conferencing is eye contact. If you just turn to the person next to you for two seconds and uh, just ask them what they... Uh, well, wait, 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 wait. 20 seconds. Go, turn to the person next to you and ask them a simple question. What do you usually eat for breakfast? And the rule is you can only look at the hairline and uh, if there's a problem with that, then just look at the eyebrows, okay? Just do that for 20 seconds. Just turn in and look... Uh, you're not allowed to look at the eyes, okay? Look at the hairline or the, yes, okay, or the eyebrows. Just do it, just 20 seconds. 20 seconds, please. It's the most important thing you can do in learning about video conferencing. Okay, so what does it feel like? Terrible. What does it feel like? Scary. Scary. What does it feel like? Uncomfortable. What does it feel like? Uncomfortable. It's impossible. It's bizarre, inhuman, impossible. Welcome to video conferencing. Video conferencing where you have a uh, camera on the top of the screen and you, the screen is here. So everyone sees my bald patch. That is all they see. I did a video conference once, my friend, uh, with the marketing director of a European multinational. All I see, saw was into his left ear. There was a camera over here. The screen was there. You know, if you want to communicate using video techniques, this is the one way to do it. If you want to win the deal, build trust, and let people see into your very heart and be convinced that you are telling the truth, this is the one simple rule of all uh, stuff, and it's this. And I will demonstrate it now if I can find a camera. Where's a camera? Okay, if you can come in nice and close, this camera here. And I hope you're up on the screen behind me. Yeah, come in nice and close. Now look, this is video conferencing. Hello, how are you? By the way, most people on video conference don't look at them, the other people, they look at themselves. That's why they keep touching themselves like this. Hello, good morning. Yeah, H how are you? Zero contact. Now you look straight into the camera. You see the difference? Do you see that? I hope you can. I can't look behind me. You say, hi. Yeah, I'm talking to you. No, I'm not. Can you see the difference? It's incredibly sensitive. And that's from a camera that far away. So, uh, the, talking to a camera, let's make it human. Once again, we're learning that the future is not about video conferencing, it's about emotion. That's what it is. Um, and when we tackle emotion, when we connect with emotions, then things really start to happen. And here's one final thing, uh, really. Uh, and that is, here's another thing where I think we go wrong. Um, you know, I, I, I've been, uh, our house is being rebuilt at the moment and I'm having to phone loads and loads of builders, the gas board, the electricity people, the water board, and everyone in the world. And you know what? I, the same thing always happens and you, you know what is going to happen now. Press one for counts. Press two for, uh, press three for, and I go on and on through layer after layer and then brrr, cut off to go back again. Put your hands up if you find that as annoying as I do. You know, I feel that people who install such... Well, I, I mustn't get carried away. I, what you've told me uh, is exactly what your customers tell me. Now, this is the most embarrassing question I'm going to ask all evening, and I'm glad you've got the lights really down low, because I don't want anyone to be embarrassed. Okay, truth time. I want you to put your hands up once more if your company has such a system. Come on, come on, come on. Will you give yourselves a round of applause for your honesty? Thank you very much. Now, listen. What are we doing? You have just told me, my friends, that you think that anyone who installs such a system should be regarded as a criminal, be put in prison, and throw away the key for 100 years, correct? That's why you put... Yes, yeah, okay. But that's what we're doing. So why is it that we put in systems which we know will make our customers absolutely mad. I'll tell you the saddest thing. I don't have any relationship with the water company except on the phone. My only relationship with them is on the phone. 
It's the same with a telco company. It's the same perhaps with your business. And that is why how we receive the calls is incredibly important. What I'm saying, my friends, is that I think sometimes we use technology in the wrong way to take human beings away from the one place where we can build an emotional relationship, which is when a customer is in trouble and they need help fast. And remember, we said it was 30 seconds to lose a third of your business. In future, it'll be 10. 10 seconds to get through to a warm, compassionate, intelligent, informed human being who can deal with my problems. And that's what your customers really want. And you might say, oh, it's impossible, Patrick. It's much too expensive. No, it's not. Because when we use technology in the right way, then we find that mo many of the customers we identify as they're coming in because they called before. So I say, oh, hello, Patrick, and how are you? How is the house? I haven't spoken to the, the, this company for three months. But my call has automatically been switched through to Terry's desk because he knows me best. And I, I'm sorry, you're probably looking for Terry. He's out at the moment. Um, but. I, Wait 20 seconds, I can just see the case coming up now on the screen. How can I help you? Wow, that's what intelligent technology is about. It's focused, it's personal, it's friendly, and the aim is that it's very emotional. It helps a human being who's a complete stranger become a close friend. I would be so grateful for a call like that, wouldn't you? If it's three o'clock in the morning and there's water pouring through my roof for the third time in a month uh, for the same problem, I would be very glad of someone answering the phone like that. So what do we learn then? When we're talking about disruption in the consumer, disruption in communities of people, and disruption in our companies, what we learn is this, that the winners will be, as we heard already before, um, in, 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 as you heard before I spoke, that the winners will be visionary companies who think rapidly out of the box, who prepare to embrace radical new partnerships because you can't do it on your own. It's new synergies, new relationships, new technology partners and the rest because life's too short to go on reinventing the wheel. It's too expensive. If someone has already done it for someone other, another company, even if it's a competitor, it's great to just grab the same technology and have it as effort one eighth of the cost or less. Um, to embrace radical new partnerships and ways of working, to integrate our processes so that our IT flows in as part of the business strategy rather than fighting with it. Um, and to create reliable products and services that meet real needs. And of course, the ultimate slogan for every business is this, and how could it not be? Why do we exist? We exist to make our world, your world a better place. Through our products, through our services, we're here to solve your problems. That every single business here tonight is based on that fact, that you sell a promise you sell a promise that you will deliver, and when you deliver, someone's world, somewhere, will be better at a price which they believe will be reasonable considering this huge benefit. And you know what? Therefore, the purpose of every business here tonight is to deliver on that promise. It's as simple as that. It's a moral issue. If you make me a promise, and you're going to charge me a lot, I want you to deliver, deliver on it. And when you do, my friends, because it is so rare for businesses to actually deliver on their promises every time. When you actually do, I will reward you with a huge, whacking great reward, which will be your profit. Why? Because it's so unbelievable. I actually found a company that made a big promise to me, delivered on time, under budget, and did it in the most spectacularly wonderful way that was stress-free for me. I'll be back there tomorrow. And you know what? You could charge me a premium price. I would probably go for 20% up on what you charged last time. Why? Why would I take the risk with anyone else when I know that you're the best and that you actually deliver? So making life better, that's what IT was intended to do. And as we connect with the passions that people have, we get close to their real needs, whether it's our consumers or the people we work with, we will build successful businesses, build a better future, and a profitable one. Thank you very much.